Moving now to cost of capital. Cost of capital is the cost of raising funds and what you are looking at here is one of the most important formulas in corporate finance. The weighted average cost of capital is essentially a weighted average of the cost of raising money through debt, through preferred shares and through common equity. Debt is tax deductible, interest payments are tax deductible so that's why with debt we have 1 minus T. Payments to preferred shareholders, so preferred share dividends and common share dividends are not tax deductible, so therefore you don't see any 1 minus T over here. It's very hard to pass the exam without knowing this formula. The weights should be based on market values and target capital structure. In the absence of explicit information about target capital structure, you can use the following. Current capital structure based on market values or the trend in the firm's capital structure or you can look at competitors and consider their capital structure. The cost of capital is the rate of return that suppliers of capital require as a compensation for their contributions of capital. Again, when a bank lends money to a company, it requires a certain return that is shown over here. When preferred shareholders give money to a company, they require a certain return. So what the weighted average cost of capital is doing is simply taking a weighted average of all those costs. And then connecting this material with what we saw in capital budgeting, if you do a project where the return on the project is 12%, so you're doing an average risk project, the return there is 12%, and the marginal cost of capital is 10%, then you should do the project because your return is higher than the cost. And this little term here, marginal, is important. Marginal means the cost of raising additional capital. So obviously since you are doing a project which is in the future and you are expecting a return of 12%, that 12% has to be compared with the cost of raising money, additional money. If your past cost of capital was 13% for some reason, then you still do the project because the marginal cost is 10%. On your exam, here is a classic question. You might be given the marginal cost of capital is 10%. The historical cost of capital is, let's say, 14%. And then you will be asked whether you compare 12 with 10, or you compare 12 with 14, or whether you compare 10 with uh, 12 with the average of 10 and 14. And many people who don't know what is going on will take the average and say that just looks like the logical thing. But you are smarter than that. You are going to take 10% because that is the marginal cost of capital. For average risk projects, use VAC to compute NPV. Adjustments to the cost of capital are necessary when a project differs in risk from the average risk of a firm's existing projects. The discount rate should be adjusted upward for higher risk projects and downwards for lower risk projects. On this single slide, we are going to summarize how to calculate the cost of capital for different sources of capital. Let's start with debt. Cost of debt is the cost of debt financing to a company when it issues a bond or takes out a bank loan. If a company takes out a bank loan and the cost of borrowing from the bank is 10% and the tax rate, let's say, is 30%, then what's the cost of borrowing? It would be 10% into 1 minus 0.3, which is 7%. If a company issues a bond, then you can calculate the cost of borrowing by computing the yield to maturity. And let's say a company issues a bond where the par value is 1000. It's a five year bond and the proceeds that are raised equal 900. So how will you do this on the calculator? You will essentially put in the PV is equal to minus 900. N is equal to five payment if it's a 10% coupon bond, then payment is going to be... Um, 900, 900, 90. So it's a 10% coupon, so it's uh, going to be 100. I'm just saying very simplistically, it is a five-year annual pay 10% coupon bond. So payment will be 100, FE will be 1000, and you compute the uh, interest rate. That is the IRR of this project, and the IRR is also the yield to maturity. So you have seen this in quantitative methods. 
you see this here, you see this in fixed income, and I can guarantee that in some form you will see it on the exam. Anything that shows up in that many parts of the curriculum is bound to show up. So it's fairly straightforward, so I'm not spending too much time. Debt rating approach simply says that you understand the debt rating of your company. You look at other companies with the same debt rating, and you look at the YTM on the bonds that they have issued. So that is how you come up with the cost of debt. And then after tax would mean you simply multiply by 1 minus your marginal tax rate. The cost of preferred stock is the, the cost of preferred stock is the cost that a company has committed to pay preferred shareholders and preferred dividend as preferred. The cost of preferred stock is the cost that a company has committed to pay preferred stockholders as preferred dividend. The formula is that the cost of preferred stock as a rate is equal to the dividend that you have agreed to pay, the annual dividend, divided by the current stock price. Not the par value, not the old stock price, the current stock price. Cost of equity is the rate of return required by a company's stockholders. Commonly used approaches for estimating cost of equity are shown right here. The most commonly used one is the capital asset pricing model that we see here. We see in portfolio management and then we see in equity. So again, this is a guaranteed question. So you cannot pass the exam without knowing the capital asset pricing model. So you'll be given the risk free rate, the beta, and this is the market risk premium. Or you might have to use the dividend discount model. This works in efficient markets. If you assume that the stock is efficiently fairly priced, then the cost of equity is D1 over P0 plus G. And G, the long-term sustainable growth rate, is the retention ratio minus ROE. And retention ratio is the same as 1 minus payout ratio. The third method is bond yield plus risk premium. So a company might have issued a bond. The YTM on the bond is 10%. And you believe that equity should have a premium of 3% over the bond. So according to this method, the cost of equity is 13%. All right, then on this slide, I cover some additional items. Everything that I've covered so far, I think, is the highest probability of being tested because that represents the core of uh, cost of capital. Then this is somewhat peripheral, but it is still good to know. Let's say that you want to estimate the required return for either a private company or for a division of a company or a large project within a company. So the beta of that project is not easily known. To come up with a required rate of return using CAPM, you need to know the beta of that project. So how do you come up with the beta of a private company or a project? You use a method called the pure play method. So that's the first point to remember. Remember this name, because some questions might just require you to know the name of the method. Then there is a three-step process that you need to be aware of. Identify comparable publicly traded company and estimate its beta. So if you have a milk division, then you identify another company that is a milk company and figure out their beta. But that other public company that you identify will have its own debt to equity ratio. So you unlever. So you find the comparable company's unlevered beta using this formula. The unlevered beta is always going to be less than the equity beta. So if the equity beta, which is the beta of the stock of that company, is 1.5, then you unlever by using this formula. So you multiply 1.5 by 1 over 1 plus this expression. So 1 minus t into debt to equity. So just remember a couple of things. One is that the asset beta is always going to be less than the equity beta. So when you have the formula for asset beta, it will be equity beta multiplied by 1 over 1 plus something. This ensures that the number will come down. And the something is debt to equity 
times 1 minus t. Wherever you have debt, you just have 1 minus t. So you come up with the asset beta for your company, and then your company or your division has a certain degree of leverage measured by its own debt to equity. So then you lever up your own company using this. Now, even though I think that this is less important than some of the other material, but at the end of this reading, there are lots of questions related to this. So that's why to be safe, as long as you remember these formulas and do those questions, you're covered. I cannot imagine anything on the exam more complicated than what's already in your book. Next point. There is a lot more to this than I'll cover, but I think this is the core information that we cover in a crash course. Let's say you are a US-based investor and you are investing in an emerging market such as Brazil. So obviously for you, there is a risk associated with the country. That risk is captured using the country risk premium. So the cost of equity of investing in a Brazilian company is the risk-free rate plus beta into now, a slightly higher market risk premium. So notice it's the return on the market minus the risk-free rate plus a risk premium related to the country. Now, there is a lot more to this, but I think the probability of being tested on exactly how we find that country risk premium is relatively low. If you don't know it at this stage, I would not spend too much time on the details of the country risk premium. And then the final point on the slide is flotation costs. Obviously, when a company issues shares or issues debt, there will be a flotation cost. You need to pay the investment bankers for helping you raise money. They are marketing costs, distribution costs, and so on. Simplistically put, there are two ways of dealing with flotation costs. One way is to subtract the flotation cost from the price. So you will then have a slightly higher cost of equity and then you discount cash flows using this higher cost of equity this is done but there is a slight problem with this approach the problem is that you are paying your flotation costs largely up front and then you get a higher rate so you are discounting future cash flows at a higher rate so an academic will say that that doesn't really make sense you have not really increased your risk, so you should not be discounting your future cash flows at a higher rate. So the other approach is to adjust the cash flows. So whatever your expenses are, those expenses associated with the flotation costs are subtracted from the project or the company cash flows, and then you discount at the regular cost of equity. So approach two is the recommended approach. It's recommended by the CFA Institute, even though in practice, the first approach is used often. Next point is marginal cost of capital and breakpoints. As a firm raises more capital, the cost of different sources of finance will increase. Clearly, as you keep taking on more debt, the cost of debt goes up. If you keep trying to raise more equity, the cost of equity goes up. The marginal cost of capital shows the weighted average cost of capital for different levels of financing. So over here, what I'm showing you is one possible scenario. A break point is the amount of capital at which the component cost of capital changes. So how do you calculate the break point? So actually, uh, the way you calculate the so how do you calculate the break point? It's based on this formula: the amount of capital at which the component cost of capital changes divided by the weight of the component in the capital structure. So if your capital structure looks like this, debt is forty percent and equity is sixty percent, and you are told that your debt structure or your cost of borrowing is such that up to 4 million the cost of debt is 14 percent and then beyond 4 million the cost is 16 percent with equity up to 9 million cost is 20 percent beyond 9 million cost is 22 percent so what's the first break point break point a it is the point at which the cost of debt changes which is 4 million divided by the weight of debt, which is 
point four, so that is ten. So there should be no percent here. So that is ten million. So this is capital in millions. And then break point B is nine, which is the amount at which the cost of equity changes divided by the weight of equity. So that's uh, fifteen. So these are the two break points. And then what's the weighted average cost of capital up to raising 10 million? You can do the calculation based on the VAC formula. Then you can say for 12 million, what's the cost of capital? For 16 million, what's the cost of capital? It's a fairly straightforward calculation. One point to keep in mind here is that on the exam, you might be given the following. Debt to equity ratio is two thirds. Okay, so from this, you need to figure out that the weight of debt is 0 0.4 and the weight of equity is 0 0.6. Make sure you know how to do that.